is the launch station, the only place you need to look for all things onboarding, implementation, and customer success. Tune in for insights from industry experts every week. Hey everyone, welcome to yet another episode of The Launch Station. Uh, today we're going to talk about a topic that's pretty interesting for the PS space, probably not something you've heard of in the context of professional services. Uh, the, the theme of today's discussion is going to be know your landscape. And uh, our guest for today is someone who's, who's uh, I would say, very accomplished, you know, from an academic side, as well as, you know, has, has done great things uh, where he works. So uh, pleased to welcome Michael Canzoneri. Uh, and, uh, you know, a little bit of background about him. Uh, Michael is the practice director at Confluent. He drives some of the most disruptive and innovative big data solutions across multiple industries for them. He has led multi-year global transformative projects at, in, in retail, aerospace, defense, and oil and gas. Uh, Michael develops strategies and positions companies for dramatic growth. And you'll see how he does that as we go through this episode. He has an MBA from Villanova, and uh, he's also studied data science as, at Harvard and quantum computing at MIT. Uh, that's pretty impressive. Welcome again, Michael. Thanks for having me. But you remember, uh, I, I talk about my, my education uh, a good bit uh, when I talk to people who I'm, I'm mentoring, but I always bring up the following thing. Uh, regardless that I went to Villanova, Harvard, or MIT, I bleed blue and white because I'm a Penn Stater. Uh, so my undergrads from Penn State. So everything in this house <laughs> is from Penn State, uh, and it's uh, you know it's so, our our first love in this house. <laughs> Lo loyalties are with Penn State, clearly. Yes, sir. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, you know, for those who don't know Michael, he has a background in theater and writing as well. So here's a quick uh, question to start off our conversation, Michael. Uh, books adapted into screenplays can be very divisive, right? Like, would you rather be in charge of adapting a book into a screenplay or writing an original screenplay? Uh, really good question. I differ on this. Uh, so the audience knows I've won uh, several uh, film festivals for a screenplay I've written called Limo Cop with uh, some friends. Uh, I kind of like the idea of adapting a book into a screenplay. Uh, so I've written a number of screenplays now. I've written several books. And with screenplays, what I have found, and with books, the amount what you see on a page is uh, about 10% from what I typically write. So for instance, uh, my first book was actually a, a Star Wars fan fiction. And I probably wrote four to 500 pages before I even wrote a page for the book. Because a lot of it was character uh, development, plot development, how does everything flow and how does it all tie together? Uh, kind of like what we're going to be talking about today uh, as well uh, from a, a weird perspective. Because I kind of think in those terms, like how do these, uh, these independent players uh, come together? Uh, in you know the landscape that you know is confluent is data in motion, or you know when I was at Gartner for instance, uh, so I would say adapting a, a book because you have some source material to start with, and probably would be equally challenging if not more to you know figure out what to keep, what to leave out, and so on as well. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, uh, that, that's great. And, and uh, nice parallels that you're going to probably draw through our conversation. Uh, so you come from a diverse background, started off as a Java developer to you know, now being a professional services practice head. Uh, can you share with our viewers and listeners how that journey unfolded? Yeah, uh, it, it's kind of a very weird journey uh, in many respects. Uh, I actually started off at Penn State as an astrophysics major. Uh, but uh, realized very quickly that I would have to go to school for many more years uh, before I, I really started my, my career in earnest. 
Uh, so I, 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 I pivoted to become an operations and information systems management major. Mm. That was super interesting to me because it really dealt with process engineering. Uh, so little fun fact, the term thinking out of the box actually comes from process engineering. Uh, in terms of, you know, a, a box represents a, a process. And often people say, well, what happens outside of the process? And can we do something out there to bring it in and improve the process? Uh, so uh, changed my major, ended up uh, getting a job offer to become a, a Java developer out of the blue. Matter of fact, the, the place that offered me is only about a, a half a mile from where I live right now, but that was 20 something years ago. Uh, so, you know, from there, uh, I started becoming, uh, I started doing Java. Uh, I jumped over to a very small consultancy because I was actually laid off twice in the first year and a half. Uh, I came out of school because of the dot-com bubble and then 9-11. Uh, uh, so I was kind of a, 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 a caught between, you know, the dot-com bubble and the 9-11 events. So uh, I found myself looking for a new job and uh, ended up at this uh, two-person consulting team. And from there, we grew it to over 200 people. And, and I stood there for about eight years. Uh, I was doing a lot of implementation work, but I felt I wanted to do something more strategic. And I happened to have an, I had an old customer who was working at Gartner uh, in their advisory team. Uh, so he offered me a job. I went and worked there for about four years. Broke out on my own for a few years there as well. Uh, and uh, somewhere along the way, I felt like I needed to get the Silicon Valley experience. So uh, out of the blue, again, Datastax contacted me, uh, the Apache Cassandra company. I spent three years there. And after three years, I was like, oh, time for me to move on. And again, out of the blue, Confluent contacted me uh, and I just celebrated my three-year anniversary about two weeks ago. You know, all along the way, uh, I had other like side projects. I had a real estate investment company. Uh, I did several other small startups as well. So, you know, just a really, I think a really uh, fun and interesting career I've had so far. Yeah. And the interesting thing to me when you narrated this before, like when we last caught up was also the fact that I think Everywhere it was like either a previous customer or someone you're engaged yeah. with pulling you into a new entity, which was interesting as well. Don't, don't ever underestimate the power of your network. Right. So what are the key areas of focus when it comes to your work at uh, Confluent in the professional services space? What are you focused on evolving there? Yeah, so I, I often say that my, my role has uh, five pillars in terms of what I deal with on a daily basis. Uh, the first and foremost is the team uh, on a daily basis, just looking at them, thinking of, you know, how are we progressing our people? Are we not progressing our people? What types of roles do we need? And how, you know, how do those people fit into there? And, and so on and so forth. The second one is strategy. Uh, are we offering our customers the right things? Uh, what's our landscape look like? both from a product perspective and a partner perspective and a competitive perspective. You know, the sales component, billing component or delivery, and finally operations and how it all ties together at the end of the day. Uh, so those five pillars are what you know, I bounce back and forth between all the time on a daily basis. But I often say, you know, beyond the team being the first and foremost thing in my mind, the next thing that I think I spend the most time on is the strategy and looking out 18 to 36 months and wondering, you know, where are we going? Where's our competition going? Where's our product going? Where is, for instance, with us, the data in motion ecosystem going? Uh, so I spent a lot of time thinking about thinking about that. I say to my, I say to people, a, a, a big part of my job is uh, reading and predicting the future. Uh, whether I'm right or wrong about that uh, remains to be seen. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, quite often when I, you know, think about PS or talk to folks in PS, we're, uh, you know, more often than not discussing about 
like optimization and you know the operations side of things and of course you know people development uh, utilization rates profitability repeatability those kind of things as well it's interesting that you mentioned strategy as like the second sort of area after people that that you put most focus on why why is strategy important from a ps perspective isn't that something that the product folks probably care more about uh and and you know how does it fit into the larger scheme of things for the company yeah uh, it's very philosophical with me uh i i love the book uh good bad uh, good strategy bad strategy uh because it articulates some of this philosophy i deal with the the large consultancies almost every day uh whether they be the accentures of the world the deloits to regional consultancies or system integrators. We often refer to uh, both of those groups as SIs, uh, system integrators. And what strikes me a, a lot of times in these large consultancies is the commoditization of their services. Uh, and I, I always like giving the example of a SQL developer. SQL has been around for decades now. Who's to say that an Accenture or a Deloitte or an IBM can quantify how much better their SQL developer is. Not that I would expect them to have SQL developers, but it's a com it's a commoditized language now. It's ubiqui ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Matter of fact, it's so ubiquitous that you see software products coming out now that almost put their own version of SQL into the uh, into their product. You have this commodity. How do you differentiate? You can't just you know pound your chest and say I'm the best. You know what are you really offering your customer to really look at you and say, oh, you know what? If I need a SQL developer, I, I'll go to one of the low cost providers. But if I need a thought leader, uh, and I need somebody to help me, for instance, what I do every day is data in motion. Why don't I go to the the people who? All they do all day long is think about this, this one area. Uh, and even though data in motion or event streaming is an ecosystem, it's very uh, Kafka or Confluence centric. So I spent a lot of time thinking about how do we uh, mature our offering from a PS perspective to complement the, evol the ever evolving ecosystem that we find ourselves in. Uh, and a lot of times, especially with very technical products like a Confluent slash Kafka. And for those of you who don't know, Confluent uh, was founded by the three uh, founders of Apache Kafka. Uh, it's a very technical product, as it should be. It's solving one of the uh, one of the most interesting and hardest problems in computer science uh, that there is. It's distributed computing at high speeds, great volume, say classical definition of big data. So I, I often ask myself, how do we make ourselves different from the other consultancies out there? How do I make our team members want to be here and do, do interesting things? Uh, so since it's such a technical product, we think about things like layering on top of the technical piece, the pieces that actually make a technical product stick. If you work at a product company, a lot of times the sales team will talk about stickiness. All that really means is how can we use our IP or intellectual property to make our product stand out? I kind of think of professional services the same way. How do we make our IP stand out? Makes sense. Yeah, I think product teams talk about adoption and how do you, you know, onboard well to create the right... right adoption for the you know customers the users and likewise you're saying hey from a technical implementation standpoint as well there needs to be a service offering uh, that that makes the customer realize the value right. of, of what it is that you know could you give us an example of what these offerings look like like what would it have been if strategy wasn't involved like if it were a commodity versus what a differentiated yeah. service looks like. Yeah, uh, you see this every day in really large organizations. You'll go talk to, as a matter of fact, I was talking to somebody 
uh, at a big bank, uh, a friend who uh, we used to work together, and he runs basically this shared service organization. And he's like, oh, you need uh, this database or this database or this database. We have them all. We're a big bank. We have all these, all these technologies. It just comes down to the, your requirements. So, you know, to me, that, that is kind of the worst place to be in if you're a technology uh, company, if you're a product company, because it's really up to the, the end user who's choosing between, you know, the, the shopping cart of, you know, for instance, databases or any other type of product that has to basically say, oh yeah, your product is the right product. So from an offering perspective, if it was commodity, that's what you get, right? You like, oh, you have these ten databases or these you know, these ten event streaming or data in motion solutions. Pick one. Which one do you like? Someone will eventually say, oh, you know, I read something about that, or I read something about that. I'll just use that. How it's different, how I think of it, and you know, how we at Confluent think of it, is it's not just the technology; uh, it's the people and process that go with it. And you know, I always make fun of the the standard. Uh, consulting answer. You know, it's the people, the process, and technology. In many ways, yes, but what we have found here, it's really about the people. Uh, it's how you enable them. It's how you define their role with data in motion. So we spend a lot of time uh, with customers who are talking about really advancing and maturing themselves with data in motion and telling them you how to do that, how to get from a level one, which is infancy, to a level five, which is the most cutting edge, bleeding edge organization you can possibly be with data in motion. And that makes us stand out, I think. Uh, it's not just about you know, throughput and getting data from point A to point B. It's about actually using the product and all its facets to get you something well beyond that. Amazing. Uh it would be great if you can actually talk us through the journey of transforming, like you, you've been uh, three years at Confluent, right? How was PS positioned and operating in the past versus what are some of the changes you've brought in with this you know, understanding of the landscape and evolving it? Yeah, it, was, it wasn't quick. Uh, I'll be honest with, uh, with you with that one. Uh, and I'll I tell everyone that it, it wasn't quick. At first, it was very workshop focused, meaning you, you're a, a big bank and you want an architectural design session. Well, that's a, a week long session with one of our solution architects. Uh, so it was very fixed. Uh, when I first entered, I think you know, something like 80 or 90 percent of our stuff was very workshop focus that we sold. Shortly thereafter, uh, when I joined, uh, I was like employee five something, I think, 500 and something. Uh, now we're, you know, I think, somewhere in the 2000 mark. I don't even know the exact number, quite frankly, because that's how much <laughs> we've grown in three years, which is kind of amazing. Um, but what we've noticed is as our customer base grew, the needs became very different. That book, Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore, uh, to a T, uh, just laid out our future at Confluent and still does in many respects. What we were used to were the innovators, right? The early adopters. As we hit the early majority, those needs changed greatly. So the workshops wouldn't suffice anymore. It became much more custom scope developed. And then as we progressed even further, we had very large organizations coming to us and say, how do we do this at scale? We've done center of excellences with SAP and Oracle and all these other technologies. How do we do it with you to make you the de facto standard for us for data in motion? Again, you know, the customer kind of led us down that path. We were thinking about it as well, but we took the opportunities that came to us to develop this idea about how do we present a, what we call a data in motion blueprint or DIMBY for short to a customer to help them get from a very 
early um, stage of maturity to a very advanced stage of maturity in a short amount of time. So it was really kind of a push pull uh, in that, you know, a customer would kind of pull us along. And as we get pulled along, we develop some stuff and push it out to other customers. And then another customer would come along, pull us along, say, hey, we need this. And we'd like, oh, okay, let's continue to develop this. So that's how this, this really evolved. It was very opportunistic. And it was us as a leadership team kind of looking at the market and saying, what are some of our biggest customers asking for? And how can we develop that and then reuse it across the organization for customers of all sizes? Uh, it's still a work in progress. And I think it will be for a number of years. Uh, and it's mainly because of where we are as a company in our journey. Uh, I think that's what you'll see in, in any uh, startup. I think that's successful. Uh, any good start of it, at least. You'll see them evolve to the customer needs. And hopefully, um, as we try to do, get out in front of that and be more prescriptive. Got it. And, and so would you say the you know the maturity model of sort saying hey you're at level one level two level three some sort of formalization around that has has happened as you've seen yeah. the customer demands evolve yeah uh, actually we had the customer maturity model uh, very early on uh, and what i you know when i talk to customers about it i actually make fun of it and the reason i make fun of it is because you've seen that maturity model in every other organization, every product company you've ever dealt with. Matter of fact, if you, you look at a company like IBM that has a, a massive portfolio of uh, technologies and products, they probably have just as many, if not more maturity models, right? What I think is different uh, with what we have done is we've actually, for each of those levels, and there's five levels, basically from early awareness to central nervous system, level five. So level one to level five. With each of the, the levels, what we've done uh, at Confluent is we've taken a step back and said, okay, looking at the hundreds of projects we've delivered, what does it mean to really be a level one? What capabilities, and we call them capabilities, what do you need for you to be successful there? And a level two level three, level four, level five. And then we did several things with the, each of those capabilities. We said, we defined what it was, why it's important, who's involved, prerequisites, the actual steps to implement it, the outcomes, and the training that one would need to actually implement that capability. And we did that for 50 or so capabilities. And actually, we just recently um, uh, released the book, The Definitive Guide to Data in Motion. And that's what that book contains. It talks about how you get from level one to level five from a technology perspective, not necessarily a people process perspective, although it's sprinkled in there. That's how we approached it. Got it. And as you've gone through like maturing uh, PAs and, and having more cognizance around your landscape, how you want to define your, your strategy for the ARG. What are some of the side effects of the transformation that's that's been happening? Skills change, right? The skills you need, uh, the roles you need, they change. And I think this is true for every very technical company uh, I've worked with. Uh, every, every technical product company, I should say, that I've worked with. The early people who have worked at those companies who, when it was still an early stage startup, almost all of them are brilliant, right? They are very technically focused. As you mature, theoretically, the, the product gets easier, right? Your, your product team is taking customer feedback and they're, they're smoothing out those sharp edges. Right. Uh, as your team evolves and your customer needs evolve, the, the, the things that your team needs, the skills that they need will also evolve. And what you'll notice is the, the need for the, the real hardcore technology gets balanced, balanced out with the, the soft consulting skills, uh, especially, and this goes back to the book Crossing the Chasm, especially when you hit the early majority. Mm -hmm. a, lo a lot of 
uh, con consumers of the technology really just want an easy button at times. And you kind of have to manage expectations, which is a very consulting thing to do, right? A very consulting skill that you need. So in the early stages, your very tech technical people are just there. They're so in ingrained in the technology. It's just like, here, boom, 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 get these things done, get this, the system up, get data in, get data out. It's not about painting a bigger picture. It's not about necessarily enabling everyone and everything on everything. It's like, this is a, this is this customer just wants a working system. They'll figure out how to manage it, how to train their people later on. They want to, they want a working system. So as your customers evolve, it's more about, it balances out then, right? It's, oh, we want a working system, but we also want to learn how to fish for ourselves. So, you know, the hardcore technical people have to then take a step back and say, okay, I know how to do this, but how do I explain it? I know how to do uh, Confluence slash Kafka, but how do I explain what a, a topic is? How do I explain what a producer or a consumer is? How do I explain uh, cloud networking? And you know, how do I get the security team on board with what we're doing? So the, the skills as you evolve as a company, as a team, as a product, often um, balance themselves out in that respect. Makes a lot of sense. And as you hire, as your need to hire more people happens, I guess you will find more people with the consulting skill rather than deep technical expertise in, in your product. And Theoretically, right now, I think everyone's dealing with uh, the great resignation uh, where, where people are en masse leaving companies and joining other companies. I think finding that talent right now is exceptionally hard. Uh, so a lot of times I tell people uh, my, my hiring philosophy is very simple. I will pick every day of the week a person with an A personality and B technical skills over a person with A technical skills and B personality. More often than not, you could teach the person the technology. You can't teach them some of the soft skills that make customers really love working with that person. My own, uh, my just my own consulting experience over the years. Uh, you know, people who were brilliant but had zero person uh, personality were often not asked back to customers. Uh, but people who were uh, you know, had a, a good personality, asked good questions, uh, were coachable. Uh, they get the benefit of the doubt at times and customers will all, almost always ask them back because they're easy to work with. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. And, you know, as these, you know, as, as you've affected change in the company over the last few years, are there any points in time where you had to get buy-in from top management around key decisions you're making around teams or around your strategy with the PSR? Yeah, I, I, here's the funny thing. Uh, I think I, I've learned this over the last decade or so. It's not just about uh, getting the top management to buy in. Uh, what I, I have found over the last you know, 10 years, the last six working in product companies in Silicon Valley, is uh, it's not just about the top, you know, brass like nodding their heads saying, "Yeah, that works." It's more about getting the team to understand the vision. Uh, I've both been successful in some respects, and I've been I failed in some respects. So you have to really think about uh, the messaging and the communication, the communication style. Uh, more, uh, more so than anything, I think, even as your team grows, uh, especially as your team grows, over the, over the past three years, for instance, you know, we've grown by a multi, uh, multiple uh, in terms of our team members. Uh, they're everywhere across the country for me, right? And how they process information is very different 
uh, across the entire team. Some people like seeing things written, some people like in, in an email, some people like seeing things in slides, some people just like talking one-on-one, -on -one. some people just like listening into uh, an all-hands meeting. So you, I, I think what I've learned is to be uh, varied in my communication styles and be consistent in my communication styles. Uh, so you, getting the buy-in from the top brass is nowhere near as hard as getting uh, buy-in from the team as a whole and then uh, other stakeholders who are involved and who you need along the way. Uh, what was like the hardest decision you had to take with it, like get buy-in on with the team? Uh, I wouldn't say there was a hardest there are consistently challenges when you're growing in a hyper growth company. And one of the things I found myself being deficient in is the assumptions I made. I assumed people understood uh, some of the variables that I was making decisions against. Some of the things that I saw that they, they may have not. Uh, so I think there, there's probably not one really, oh, this is a really hard decision. It's, it's more about uh, there's a series of hard decisions that you make, you know they're hard decisions, but when you go back, you didn't realize how hard they were and how you may have not communicated well enough at times. And you know, it just informs me again and again, when I talk to people, I would say, oh, you know, we're doing that. And they're like, what do you mean we're doing that? I haven't heard anything about that. So it, it causes me a pause, it's like to pause and say, did I really communicate that well enough? Uh, did I really lay out what exactly I was thinking in an effective manner? That's one of the things, especially in a hyper growth company, that's one of the things I think I've, I've learned uh, over the past, you know, especially over the past three years, uh, you know, that growth is, it's really hard to manage. I mean, you're, if you're on a rocket ship, what typically gets taken with you on the rocket ship is the stuff that's right in front of you. And the stuff you leave right. behind is important, but it's not urgent. <laughs> so you have to try to find that balance. And you know, it'll, it'll come back and bite you uh, in, in the future. So the only thing you could hope for is the uh, foresight to say, I know this is not especially urgent right now, but I know it's important. And I'm gonna keep on moving this forward and communicating why I'm doing that. So those are some of the things I think I've learned over the years uh, with this. Uh, so I think that's, that's really, you know, good, good advice, good inputs on, on what, you know, you face in, in high growth environments. I've seen that myself at Freshworks and again at, at Rocket Lane, we do have, I mean, I, you can think of them as happy challenges, but they're still challenges that we need to right. deal with and, and figure out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. Happy challenges. <laughs> Cool. So uh, we come to the next section of our podcast. It's a quick rapid fire. Uh, sure. And you, you're, you're going to have to give us the first thing or person that comes to your mind. Uh, sure. A habit you picked in 2021 that you will continue in 2022. The number of books I read uh, and how I read. I typically read about 20 books a quarter. Wow. So I've decided I'm going to cut back that greatly and actually read four or five books on one subject to really get varied perspectives. Uh, I did it last quarter uh, with uh, Stoic Philosophy. Uh, I'm doing it uh, this quarter with, uh, I'm harkening back to my MIT days and studying a, a lot about uh, the mathematics behind quantum physics. That, that's very interesting and, and diverse. Very and geeky. Topics. <laughs> very geeky and a very wide range of topics. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's one trend you think we'll see in the project management space in the next few years? Project management evolving to be more uh, like 
I think player coach. We see that a lot with our engagement ma our engagement managers slash project managers. They're more than just the, the typical project manager. They herd a lot of cats. They talk to customers. They're quasi technical, and getting more. It's not just about you know the work breakdown structure. It's more about really being a subject matter expert, and being able to inform the team where you may see uh, things coming up around the corner that we need to be mindful of. Interesting. Uh, what comes to mind when I say leadership? Just because I've been reading a little bit about uh, World War II, uh, Eisenhower. And I kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, whether you realize it or not, uh, the, the quadrant between important, urgent, not important, not urgent is referred to as the Eisenhower matrix. Oh, it's nice. used in uh, the book, uh, seven, the, habits of, uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That classic. Nice. Yeah. What comes to mind when I say customer? Oh, a myriad of things, uh, you know, all of which are, you know, top of mind for me. And, you know, is this customer getting what they need? It, it's probably the question that comes to mind almost immediately and always does. Uh, we have one question also from our community mm -hmm. uh, pre-flight, right? Uh, what are the top three metrics you look at for your team as a whole? And, you know, has that changed over the years? Yeah. Uh, it used to be about uh, revenue utilization. Uh, basically, it, those are the two that were just top of mind all the time for me in years past when I was in a classical consulting organization. Now I, you know, I think about those a lot, but more often than not, it has nothing to do with metrics per se. It's more about, do they have a defined career path? How are they growing? It's very um, soft in some respects. It's hard to measure. But that's the thing that keeps me up most of the nights when I think about my team. How are they growing and are they achieving their, their personal and professional goals? Awesome, that's good to know. And I'm sure your, your team would be happy to hear that. I uh, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> now one last uh, question for our, uh, before we conclude our episode. What's one piece of advice you would share with a leader who's going through a same growth journey as you? I'll give two, if that's all right. The first one sure. is easy. It's find a mentor. The second one is a piece of advice I've followed for many years now, and I, I find it to be exceptionally helpful. And it's not something that most leadership people talk about. Journaling. I talk about this at length. Um, I'm like you know, 50 or 60 pages into writing a book about it. Uh, I found that journaling 10 minutes every morning helps me to clear my head and gets me ready for the day. So especially if you're in a, a very dynamic organization, very fast paced, you have so much going on, you need a way to center yourself. And whether it's meditation for some people, for me, it's journaling. Great. I think... Uh... Yeah, I, I think everyone will have their own, but I think to add journaling in the mix uh, is an interesting option to look at, and and perhaps there's more ways for you to reflect, and you know, go back in time and see how you were reflected in the past as well. So uh, yeah, something worth trying out. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much uh, for you know chatting with us today, Michael. It was it was very insightful and. Uh, a uh, lot of ideas to take away for leaders and uh, uh, hope you continue uh, re reading as much as you do and uh, uh, sharing your inputs and insights with all of us. I hope so too. And thank you so much for having me today.